All right, so we're going to talk about uh, linear momentum and collisions. Um, and we're going to start with defining linear momentum. Linear momentum is the just the mass times the velocity. And the reason we define this is because it is harder to move things which are more massive than move things which are lighter. Um, so and then it also turns out that the force is the time derivative of momentum. So how much uh, how much force has to be applied to change something's momentum is uh, is different. It's, it depends on the mass of the object. It sort of makes intuitive sense. You know that it is harder to get to, if you're trying to push a car, it's harder to push a car and get it rolling. Um, its velocity will not change as fast as if you try to push a wagon with the same force. Um, and so this is just quantifying that. Um, and these concepts of impulse momentum and center of mass are necessary if you want to talk about things like trajectories of balls um, and what happens in collisions. Um, but also not just the stuff that we're talking about here, really cool stuff like part fundamental particle collisions and what happens when stuff breaks apart. Um, so we're going to develop these concepts for you. Um, the velocity and momentum vectors are in the same direction. Um, I actually don't like the caption in this that says that they have this have different magnitudes. It all depends on the units. If I defined the unit, if I used a unit of mass of one soccer ball mass, the velocity in um, would have the same direction. It would have the same magnitude as the momentum. It would just be different units. Everything is all about units. But regardless, the momentum is in the same direction as the velocity. Um, so they both point in the same direction. They just may have different magnitudes. And then in general, it is harder to move something that is heavier. Um, you know this intuitively. And this is one of the cases when um, in physics when your intuition is actually more or less right. Um, so if you have this, if you have a giant oil tanker, you have to apply either a lot of force very quickly or a small force over a much longer time. Um, and you know, if you have smaller things like gas molecules, you're actually being bombarded by gas molecules all the time. You just don't really feel it because they're so tiny and they are giving you little tiny packets of momentum. They're moving your momentum ever so slightly, but because they're so small, you don't feel it. And because it's all in the same, it's all in different directions. If you're sitting in a room, you don't feel the net, any net force. Now, if you're in a windy, um, if you're on a hilltop and it's really windy, you might actually feel a net force because of all of those little gas molecules hitting you. And then we're going to define a new concept. So force is the time momentum, uh, is the time derivative of um, momentum. Impulse, for, it is also the time der derivative of a force. Okay, so if we have to develop this concept, if you have the same force, oops, if you have the same force and you're applying it over a different period of time, um, we're going to make an approximation here. We we do something similar in a lot of uh, in, in often in intro classes. So we've got that the force is equal to the um, time derivative of momentum. Now, if we're either looking at a small period of time or a constant force, this is equal to the change in momentum over the change in time. And then we can write that the force times the time is equal to the, um, is equal to the change in momentum. So if you have a constant force and you apply it twice as long, you get twice the change in momentum. And we can also um, we can also talk about the chain, the impulse, or the which is a measure of the change in momentum. And um, if you apply, in this case, you're whacking a tennis ball with a tennis racket and um, you're generating an impulse, which is changing the momentum of the ball. When you hit the tennis ball, it changes its momentum. Now, 
um, impulse has the same units as momentum. Um, so when you are, if you have a known impulse, um, you can add, so impulse is gonna be your change in momentum. So here you can take your, um, it, you give, you pick a soccer ball, you give it some impulse. So what you can do is that you can drag this vector because you can always move vectors over here and you get this. <clears throat> so the final momentum is in this direction. So this impulse is the change in momentum. And at the end, you have the, um, you have a different final momentum than you had at the beginning. Okay, and impulse <clears throat> matters um, because that's also giving you some measure of the maximum force that was applied to, the, um, to an object. So if you drop your cell phone and it bounces off of the ground, you have, it, you have dramatically changed its momentum. You have a, there's a large impulse. That impulse is what damages your phone. So don't drop your phone or you have small children like me, you get a very good, strong phone case so that when your phone drops, regardless, it is protected. All right, collisions. So we often use billiard balls because they are a lovely example that, um, to, of how you can apply this stuff. Um, in the absence of external forces, momentum is conserved. So if you have, um, and I should say, in the absence of net external forces, momentum is conserved. So when you have billiard balls, you do have a normal force and a gravitational force, but there's no net um, force after you've whacked the ball with your pool stick. So in this case, you have billiard ball one smacking billiard ball two. Before the collision, you can add up the total momentum in both balls. And whatever happens in that collision, the total momentum at the end is going to be the same. Um, so now this actually gives you a vector equation. Um, so you can, so here you can see that the initial momentum and the final momentum of the whole system are the same. But when you're actually, when you're trying to write this out, you often write it out as the X components, the momentum in the X component before and after the collision has to equal the momentum in the Y component before and after the collision. Okay, so here you have another example. Two cars are in a collision. In, in this case, you're going to define the, um, the, the mo motion in one dimension. Um, so, well, you could have a two-dimensional uh, collision where the cars are moving, but if it's a rear end collision, you probably don't get any momentum in the perpendicular to the initial motion. So you have some initial um, momentum from both of the cars. Now, how do you want to define your system? You want to define your system so that momentum is conserved when the cars collide, because then you actually have something to work with. You have your equation saying that you have momentum conservation. So you, the two cars smash together. The final momentum afterwards is equal to the initial momentum. Um, and then you know how to write your equations. You can write a vector equation saying the initial momentum equals the final momentum. And usually it's easiest to break this into two, into X and Y components. Often in the problems that we're gonna give you, um, the, there's a lot of zeros. So the initial momentum of one car might be zero. Um, and then if they stick together, then it becomes a much simpler problem. But watch out for zeros because you're often gonna see ways that you can simplify that. Um, another example that you're, you're likely to run into is these air carts. Air carts are lovely because uh, the air reduces the friction between the track and the cart. So, um, so that you often can neglect friction in these cases. So if you had friction, you don't have no net external forces. So two lab carts collide and stick together after the collision. Um, so now you have one dimensional motion. Um, 
and then you can actually proceed, write your equations and find out the momentum of the final system. Um, in this case, okay, let's talk about what's going on here. A super ball is dropped to the floor, it hits the floor, it bounces off, and it returns to its initial height. So in this case, the ball collides with the floor. Now, the ball is actually giving a tiny bit of momentum to the molecules in the floor. But the floor doesn't, you don't see the floor move. It's just that the, the force is so tiny and the floor is so big. So overall, you don't see the floor move. Um, but the ball actually does have to get its momentum to go all the way back up to the top from the floor because there's nowhere else to get it. So here, in this case, you would define your system as the ball plus the floor. All right, this is a lovely one. Um, so here you have two hockey pucks. Um, the way that I would recommend doing problems all the time is you start by drawing a coordinate system. So we are going to draw X and Y. And in this case, you're told that um, the, I'll call this ball one, or puck one, and this is puck two. So, and, and they have the same mass. Um, and initially, the way that I have drawn the coordinate system, V one, initial equals 2.5 meters per second in the x direction and v2 initial equals zero now v you're told v2 final Oh, sorry, there should be a negative sign there, equals negative 2.5 meters per second in the x hat direction. And V1 final is unknown. In principle, I'm going to, you could have an x component. So I will write this V1 x final x hat plus V one y final y hat now your initial momentum oops that was cannot easily erase that without using the eraser so our initial momentum is negative 2.5 meters per second x hat and then in the final momentum is negative 2.5 meters per second plus v1 x final x hat plus v1 y final y hat. Now, I can collect all of the terms on the that are multiplied by x hat and pull them out. I'm going to move my equations a little bit. And change colors. So that's negative 2.5 meters per second equals negative 2.5 meters per second plus v one final x. Those are all the x components. They are all multiplied by x hat. So I'm going to just cross out the x hat because it's in every term. And I get that v one x final equals zero. And I can do in the same the same in the y direction, and I get zero equals v one y final. Now, you could have done this in a little bit less work by saying, eh, I don't have any y components. I can treat this as a one-dimensional problem. 
but I wanted to do it this way to show you how to structure it because you will do be you will serve yourself a lot better if you start writing down things very meticulously even if it means extra steps whenever you try to go through in your head and skip some steps that's when you are most likely to make a mistake um, also it can help to think about this if you are struggling with um, writing out all these steps and you want to just skip them think about this as conveying to you to the ta or to your instructor how you do the problem and demonstrating that you know it or teaching a strategy to a younger student so that you um so that you want to explain absolutely every step so that they see everything that can that can be a good way of getting yourself to stop resisting showing every step i think especially in high school sometimes uh oh gee i can do this really fast that's glorified over let me do this very meticulously and carefully and i would do my best to make sure i don't make any mistakes and that i can i have very clear work all right some examples um we're going to use that same strategy throughout so here we have a proton and a neutron colliding and sticking together the a proton and a neutron stuck together is called a deuteron so now i have all um i have seven times ten to the sixth meters per second I prefer X hat, Y hat, Z hat over I hat, J hat, K hat. I do not have a great explanation. Um, ah, this is, I have done, that's the velocity. I'm going to have to use, if I write uh, variables, I'm going to have to, I'm going to call this mass MP. This is MN, and this is MD, which is approximately MP plus MN. Now, fun teaser for when you get into modern physics, it is not exactly MP plus MN because the um, there's a small amount of mass in what's called the binding energy. So the mass of the deuteron is actually somewhat less than the sum of the mass of the proton and the mass of the deuteron. Okay, now m p v p plus m n v n equals m d v d. I've dropped the final and initial because the mo the proton and the neutron are all initial and the um, deuteron is final. So now I can see V D equals M P V P plus M N V N over M D. And I can also use a quick shortcut to approximate this. One of the skills that we're trying to develop, um, that we're trying to get you to develop as a physicist, is approximations. So often in high school physics, um, you were just writing numbers and trying to solve everything exactly, chug, chug, chug. Physicist goes, well, what approximations can I get away with? Um, you'll often find yourself in situations when you don't have a calculator, or in this case, I don't want to look up the exact mass of the neutron and the exact mass of the proton. So I'm going to use the approximation that the mass of the proton is equal to the mass of the neutron, and that the mass of the deuteron is approximately equal to twice, and I'm just going to call that mass in either way, twice the mass of a proton or a neutron. So when I do that, I get one half V proton, the, the final deuteron uh, velocity is one half V proton plus V neutron. And I can write this 
as one half seven minus four times 10 to the sixth meters per second x hat. Note here, I also pulled out the power, um, <coughs> the power in front because it makes life a lot easier. Okay, so now here we have seven minus four is three, three divided by two is 1.5. So our final, um, our final, final velocity is about 1.5 times 10 to the sixth meters per second. I leave it as an exercise for the student to calculate the difference between that and if you use the actual masses of the proton, the neutron, and the deuteron, um, the difference is very small. It is probably measurable, but it is very small. Okay, the next, in, in this case, you have a truck colliding with a car. Um, so your, oops, your initial momentum is going to be m t v t plus m c v c and if they stick to so that's the initial momentum i want you to notice that i am very meticulously writing vector symbols over my vectors i want you to do the same after you get past intro physics if you do not write a vector symbol over a vector you will find no mercy from your professors you are expected to know the proper notation at the end of this class okay so if they stick together so here um, I actually don't have the magnitudes for the car and the truck velocity, so I can't get, get it numerically. Um, if they stick together, you can tell um, that the net velocity or the, the net momentum is going to be traveling something in that direction. So they're actually going to slide off the road. Um, if they bounce, yeah, I think it's not looking good for the car. I think they're probably going to stick together. Okay, so here you can show what this looks like if you're adding the two velocities. Uh, sorry, the two momenta that um, you get this final momenta. Um, so the, the truck velocity is larger, but the car momentum is um, smaller because the truck is just so massive. All right, some application. An application is Rutherford scattering. Um, and to get this precisely, you actually, um, so you can do, um, you can do this in more meticulous detail and it's often done in upper division classical mechanics um, books. But when we were just trying to figure out the, mo the, the what model describes subatomic particles, you were progressively lovely. Um, one of the, the great joys in science is being wrong and figuring out what the truth is. Uh, we're wrong all the time. It's great. Okay, so in the old model, um, the old model was the Thompson model, which um, basically had a, um, had a positive charge smeared around some um, volume with the electrons stuck in it. This was called the plum pudding model. And um, and when um, Rutherford shot alpha, alpha particles, which we now know are helium nuclei, but he shot alpha particles, which we only knew that they were positively charged and that they were large, he shot them at a gold foil. If you had the Thomson model, you would expect to see um, alpha particles go through and maybe get smeared out by a little bit. Now what he saw instead was that most alpha particles went through, they were scattered slightly, well, maybe more than slightly, um, they were deflected, but some of them bounced off and returned. So this was in, this was if you have a model where most of the time they're somewhat deflected because this is a positively charged um, object. So they get deflected a little bit. And then some of the time they go boing. Um, you can do this in detail with uh, electric fields, which we will not do this semester, but you can also treat it like a, a collision and it gets, um, when, when you have 
an alpha particle come in and smack a, a gold nucleus, it can bounce, it will bounce off um, just like you had the collision of the car and the truck. Although this is more like, uh, this is more like a bowling ball hitting the truck. Okay, so here, this is a problem solving strategy. Um, when you have a two dimensional problem or a three dimensional problem, um, what you're going to do is break the initial components into their vectors. So you notice that when I was doing some of the earlier problems, I was starting by writing stuff into components. So you're generally strategies, you're going to start by defining a coordinate system. It is very helpful on a test or um, on homework or whatever, or in classwork, whatever it is, to draw the coordinate system on the picture so that it is unambiguously defined for whoever has to grade your work. Um, so the more I can tell what you did, the better that I'm gonna, the more points I'm gonna be able to give you. But the secret is you're not actually doing that to tell me what you did. I have a lot of practice figuring out what students did, even if it's sort of messy and crazy. Um, you're doing it for you so that later when you go to study for the exam, you know what you did because you will forget. So think about this as also your homework is writing future you instructions on how to do the problem. Okay, so first thing you're going to do is write a, pic, uh, write a coordinate system. Second thing you're going to draw a picture of the, of the problem. Um, you don't have to draw a great picture, but it has to be good enough. It will help you see what's going on. Um, and then in these momentum problems, you're going to break the momenta into their two components um, and write out an equation that tells you what they are. And I recommend keeping everything as variables until the very end. When you, um, when you do this, if you have two or even three dimensional problems, you're going to find that your subscripts get messy. That's okay. It will pay off in the end. Um, but be meticulous about those subscripts. It's going to pay off because you will then be able to, you will be less likely to make mistakes. Now, after you've written things out in terms of X and Y components, you are going to break the two equations apart and you say all of your initial X components equal your final X components and your initial Y components equal your final Y components. And then at this step, it becomes a sometimes somewhat messy algebra problem, but an algebra problem um, to sort out what, um, what those final momenta are. So you see, we're laying out here a multi-step process for solving a problem. I want you to write all of those steps down because the more you skip, the more likely you are to make a dumb mistake. Okay, then you get their final momenta um, and that's the answer to the problem. Now, most students actually tend to get the setup pretty much right. So the problems that when students make a mistake on the setup, they are often, well, it will either be egregious and obvious that they just wrote the wrong thing down um, or they'll make some dumb assumption and, and in, some incorrect assumption when going from this step to that step. Um, so you, you make some wrong assumption, but most of the mistakes that people make tend to be, okay, now I got these ugly equations and I'm gonna solve for the final answer. That is where well over half of the, pro of the mistakes will be made. So you also want to work on developing your skills for meticulously solving what can be messier algebra problems than what you would have had in previous classes. So far, this class is pretty lightweight. When you get to upper division classical mechanics, you're gonna have a lot messier problems and sometimes several pages. So work on solving that algebra carefully and without making stupid mistakes. The difference between an experienced physicist and a novice is that the experienced physicist catches their mistakes, not that the experienced physicist does not make them. Okay, 
center of mass. Center of mass is lovely um, because this is the reason why we've actually been able to define everything as point particles so far. So it turns out that you can define, you can treat an object as if it is um, a point particle at its center of mass, as long as it's not rotating. Um, so I, if I throw this pen, I can treat it as a point particle, but you can still you can still treat it as a rotating. It, it gets complicated if there's rotation. So we often just say, we're going to neglect any rotations. Um, so I can treat this pen as if it is entirely at its center of mass. And if you put something at its center, if you touch something at its center of mass, you can lift it by its center of mass and it's perfectly balanced. Really fun. Okay, so what is the center of mass? It is the weighted average of the position. So when you're, you often, here's where you're not going to do any, any ugly problems with me in this class. When you do these problems, it's a good idea to choose your coordinate system well because the math can get ugly pretty fast. Um, but you're basically taking the weighted average of the um, of this object. And often you're interested in um, actually let me say that was not often you're interested in the um, where you can treat the particle as being located. And here, what we're really doing, this uh, rho dv is also sometimes called dm. So I wrote this as, so often in this class, if you do problems, we're gonna have you just do weighted, you know, do sums as if you have point particles. But of course, if you get to continuous objects, you can expand this to an integral um, and, if you want to, you know, this is written as a 3D integral, but you also will have some where um, you can simplify it and do 2D or 1D integrals. Now, calculus is a prerequisite, is a co-requisite for this class, so I cannot assume that you will do, that you can do integrals, um, but I still like to show you how it fits in so that when you hit the upper division classes, it's not a totally new concept. Okay, so here you can see a cat falling and hitting its feet, uh, landing on its feet. Um, and what's happening is the cat is actually rotating at about its point, its center of mass. Um, although what's uh, the center of mass is actually what's falling. So here you can see the cat purposefully twisting its legs around. Okay, so here is a simple problem that you can do with this sum equation. So, um, here, you take the positions, you've got three particles, one, two, and three, um, and then we're going to multiply the, um, their position vectors by their mass. That slightly changes the, the size of the vectors for each of them. And then we're going to add, them, add those vectors all up. So here you can see this vector stays the same. We're going to move this vector because we're always allowed to move vectors around move that vector there, move this vector there. So we've drawn them head to tail. Um, and then you get the sum of those three vectors. And then you divide by the sum of all masses. So this is just R center mass equals one over M, where M is the total mass, the sum over M I R I. We also can write this, the sum over M I R I divided by the sum of the masses, however you would like it. So it is the weighted average of the position. So that tells you that if you had these three objects, the, um, the center of mass would, of those three masses would be somewhere about here. Okay, now you would have, you can do something like this where you have a hoop. Um, so here we would do R center of mass equals the density. So that density is going to be the, um, the mass of the whole hoop 
divided by 2 pi times the radius. And then that small segment, ds, is going to um, is going to be a length r d theta. And then you would have your, uh, here's where writing, you would have to write either x hat or y hat. Um, I can do this. Actually, you can write my unit vector cosine. I can write my um, x hat or y hat component cosine theta x hat plus sine theta y hat. Okay, so then I would have to do this integral. I sort of ran out of space, so I wrapped it around. Um, and I would find in the end that the, um, I'm not going to do it live, but I would find in the end that the center of mass is right there. Um, that, of, oh, and I, I forgot to put limits on my integral. It is from zero to two pi. So I would have to integrate over the entire area. There's a few other ways that I could set this integral up. Um, I could use entirely Cartesian coordinates, but if I did that, I'm gonna have to write this d theta in x hat and y hat. It's a little tricky. Um, and I could also do it as a 3D integral where this is a very narrow hoop. Um, so there's a bunch of ways to set it up. And if you haven't seen this before, in principle, it matters that there is some infinitesimal part of the variable that you're integrating over. It doesn't always matter where it is. Uh, it doesn't matter where it is. So we tend to move it around in physics. Um, in your inter, in your calculus, intro calculus class, you're not gonna do that, but later on you, you will do it a lot more. Okay, so if I wanted this, I'd have to solve that integral. If you didn't follow all that discussion because on this one, because you are not yet to integrals, that's okay. You can just ignore it and move on and file in your head somewhere if I have to do figure out the center of mass of complicated objects, then I want to do, um, I want to set it up so I can do integral. All right, so here you can see cool consequences of centers of masses. So you fire fireworks shells and then they explode up in the air and all of the different, um, all of the different sparks, the pretty part radiates from the center of mass wherever it exploded because momentum is conserved. All right, rockets. So we talked about a closed system. Um, the way rockets work is that they actually um, eject mass. So you no longer have a closed system. Um, and because momentum is, or you have a, your system includes the ejected mass. So when you're, if you eject mass this way, the, um, the object has to go the opposite direction. Okay. So here, if you have some rocket and it is eject, ejecting junk that way, um, it is giving the rocket a boost this way. And you usually have, um, you have a booster that, that contains mass that is designed to be burnt up. Okay, now some more examples. I'm gonna set these up, I'm not gonna solve all of them. Okay, so a person is riding in a car moving at a velocity v when the car runs into the bridge. Calculate the average force on the person if he is stopped by an, a dashboard that compresses an average of x centimeters. Oh, these are problems out of the book, but I deliberately made them more general um, and obfuscated them a little bit. Um, sometimes slightly different, so I'm not actually solving book problems. All right, so your um, this is not a, um, this is, this is not a momentum conservation problem here. You are applying an impulse. So you have 
well, we can say the initial momentum is equal to m v i. The final momentum is equal to zero. So I have a change in momentum of negative m v i. Now, the person is stopped by a dash dashboard. Um, so this we have our this is going to be the change in momentum is the force times the time and the force. So here you have to have, I think in the actual problem, it gives an amount of time that that compression occurs over. So I think I didn't give enough parts of the problem for me to solve this one exactly. Here you have a cruise ship of mass M strikes a pier at a speed of V. Often I will start writing the writing things down. So P initial equals M. Oh, I have to do big M. V initial. Um, and it comes to rest after traveling at a distance of X. So here, uh, here I can say, okay, how long did it? So I have this, again, I'm gonna have my change in the momentum is equal to negative M V I. And here, how long does it take? So let's assume um, average, if we say the change in velocity from, it, so the acceleration is the change in velocity over the change in time. This is gonna be equal to the force times the time um, that it is applied. So that is going to be equal to, have, so M times the acceleration, which is the change in velocity over the time. And that was not the useful way to do it. Um, the force So the longer the force, so the, the further the force that the boat travels, the longer it's going to take to slow down. All right. Now here, a hockey puck, puck of mass M is sliding due east on a frictionless table with a speed of V. A force of constant magnitude smacks it. What's the final force? You just add the two together. Um, so it says, uh, it says, times a time of t is equal to the change in momentum. So you can get uh, the change, the, the final, the change in momentum, add them together, you get the total momentum. Train cars are coupled together by being bumped into one another. What is their final velocity? Okay, so here you have their initial velocities. It's all in the x hat direction. Um, we are going to assume that these two train cars have the same mass. So M V1 initial plus M V ah, V2 initial equals they stick together, so their final velocity is the sum of masses. So 
here, notice that I said explicitly, I am assuming they have the same mass. If this was not stated in the problem, you should write that down. So then I get that the final velocity is equal to one half the initial velocity of the first one plus the initial velocity of the second one. So here I have 0.3 minus 0.12. So I have point, a positive 0.18 divided by two is 0.09 meters per second. And this is in the x direction. Okay, find the center of mass of the three mass system. Here, it didn't tell you where you have to um, where you have to draw your coordinate system. Um, I could do either, but I'm actually I could do anything, but it's actually probably easiest if you draw this coordinate system because then when you're calculating your position vectors, you don't have to calculate anything that is on a diagonal. You only have x hat and y hat. Okay, so then I have r center of mass equals one over the total mass times the sum of m i r i Okay, my total mass here, 150 plus 100 plus 75 is 200, 325 grams. So M is 325. Um, and then with this coordinate system, now I think most of you probably instinctively would have put the um, origin at the 100 gram mass, but one thing I want you to start doing is thinking about the problem a little bit longer before you actually start setting it up so that you before you start working a little bit of thought can save you a lot of time and energy. Okay, so now. Um, when I have one over the total mass m i'm going to call this one two and three so m1 r1 plus m2 r2 plus m3 r3 okay by putting one of the masses at the origin this r2 is equal to zero so I have one fewer term that I have to actually calculate, and I only have x and y coordinates. So because that um, m, because m2 is at the origin, I have saved myself time. And here I'm. Let's see. I'm going to go through, and r1 is negative four centimeters x hat r1 is positive three centimeters y hat um so i have one over 325 a hundred grams times four centimeters. I have negative four. Oh, this should this also has units. This has units of grams. 400 gram centimeters x hat. And then I have three times 75, which is 225. 225 y hat. Okay, so I, if I'm looking at this, that's going to tell me that in the x hat direction, um, I have 
a little bit more than one. So I'm going to count it as uh, my, I am about one and a quarter. My center of mass is at about one and a quarter in the X hat direction. And my center of mass in the Y hat direction is at about two thirds. So my total center of mass is just about there. And that sort of makes intuitive sense. The heaviest mass is the center of mass is going to be closest to the heaviest mass. All right. Here, find a center of mass of, of sphere of mass m and a radius of radius r and a cylinder of mass m and radius r and at height h arranged as shown below. Okay, I'm not going to do this in detail, but I'm going to tell you how you would do it. So instead of being intimidated by this problem, you go look up the center of mass or figure it out by symmetry of each of these objects. So here's that mass, there's that mass. Do, 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 do. Okay, so now these are aligned on this axis. So you know by symmetry because they're lined up here that there is no um, there is no component of the center of mass there, and then you can treat them like point particles at these different places. So this is um, grab this is a distance r, and this is a distance h over two. Um, so, oh, and actually I gave the sphere's radius is capital R. Um, and yeah, and the cylinder has lowercase h. Okay, so the center of mass is going to be, if I draw a coordinate system, I'm going to make this y and I'm going to make the zero in that direction right there because it's going to make the math a lot easier. So my center of mass is going to be the weighted average. I can treat these objects as point particles along the x-axis. Okay, so now by my clever use of, um, of coordinates, so again, the total R, well, actually, it's all going to be in the x direction. So I'm going to just say, or sorry, the y direction. So y center of mass is going to equal the mass of the cylinder, y of the cylinder, plus mass of the sphere y of the sphere, except now I chose this guy to be zero. So let's say plus. Uh, oh, and then divided by mass of the combined system. So the center of the of mass in these coordinates is mass of the sphere divided by the total mass, and then times r plus h over 2. Um, I can do similar tricks here. Again, I have chosen um, one of them to be at the origin because then I have zeros. Um, I like zeros. Zeros make the math easier. Now, y center of mass is going to be mass of the sphere divided by mass of the total system. This looks like I broke the work, so I'm going to fix that one. Times, now this is r plus r. So I can use clever tricks. This is where what you are trying to develop as a beginning physicist is the ability to see where those clever tricks are. Can you draw your coordinate system to make life easier? Spending 
60 seconds thinking about the right way to draw the coordinate system can save you half an hour. All right, and we're gonna stop there. Thank you, and we'll see you for the next one.